million people that visited the Florida Keys last year to go snorkeling and fishing and diving. So those reefs, those fish communities that inhabit the reefs are a huge economic draw um, to the state and to the region. So a, a really powerful recent study just came out, found that uh, the reefs of Hawaii and the Florida Keys combined bring in $2.3 billion annually. So, you know, really big receipts just from that natural system. So we think of them almost as ATMs in the ocean. If we just take care of them, they're going to kind of keep on giving to us. So one of the really fascinating things for scientists is that warming is happening, happening in a really patchy way. So it's not uniform. And one of the, the fastest warming regions is the northeast coast of the US, the Gulf of Maine, and the Arctic. Um, this region's warming incredibly fast. So the trend over the last couple of decades is about one degree Fahrenheit every two years. So that's phenomenal warming. And we're kind of using it as a way to see what the rest of the ocean is going to do in, in the coming decades when it kind of catches up to the warming we're seeing in this region. And one of the big changes we're seeing is species compositional shifts. So a lot of species in the ocean are shifting their ranges poleward. So they're moving away from the equator essentially to stay in cooler water to maintain a constant thermal temperature environment. Um, and that changes the composition of species, it changes the diversity of ecosystems, but it has really big impacts on fishing communities. And I'll show you two quick case studies. So one is the cod fishery. So of course, historically, the New England cod, cod fishery was incredibly productive. It's really the reason we colonized the New World for the cod. Um, we certainly overfished it. Um, in 2010, we started implementing really severe uh, quotas to try to restore the fishery. Um, we actually ramped those up in 2013. It hasn't really had any benefit. And as you can see here, the, both the biomass of reproductive adults and young cod, the ones that are recruiting each year, has actually been declining. And that's not due to fishing. The fishing is almost completely shut down. That's due to warming. So these are cold water fishes, and they're shifting their ranges northward. And you know, so despite you know shutting off fishing, we're not seeing any recovery in that fishery entirely due to warming. So it's kind of you know two things have gone hand in hand: the fishing and then the warming. Another example is the lobster. So a lot of people forget this, but we had a really vibrant lobster fishery off southern New England, so off of New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island um, in the 60s and 1970s. And there's a, lobster, a lot of lobster ports there like there are now in Maine. And now, of course, it's all gone. So lobster has shifted up into northern Maine. The graph on the right shows that where all the lobster are being caught now, lobster, main lobster are also cold water species that can't handle warm water. It reduces the survival of the larvae and the, the survival after they kind of settle on their benthic habitat. And soon they're going to be only up in Canada. So it's only a number of decades before Maine loses its lobster fishery, again, due to these distributional shifts. And that's a thing that's happening globally. And there's ways we can adapt to that, but they're, you know, they're not perfect. It's expensive to change your gear and to completely change your industry. So those are just two examples about how this warming impacting ecosystems has big impacts on people. And of course, it's not just warming. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions are causing all kinds of physical and chemical changes to the oceans. So there's sea level rise. And I'll even pull up your PowerPoint for you. Can you do it? Thank you so much, and thank you all for being here to learn about these important topics. And I appreciate John's wise words to start off the forum. Um, as you heard just a moment before, the ocean is undergoing dramatic change with significant impacts, both on the environment of the ocean, but also the humans that rely on it. And one of those process, processes that I'd like to talk with you about today is ocean acidification. I think probably many of you have heard about this before, but just in case you haven't, um, ocean acidification is a change in ocean chemistry that is driven by um, the ocean soaking up our carbon emissions. So it soaks it up like a sponge. About 30% of, of what we emit to the atmosphere goes straight into the ocean and fundamentally changes the chemistry of the ocean in doing so. Oh, come back. Okay. 
Some of these impacts I think you probably have heard about before. Um, for example, that changing chemistry makes it very challenging for things like oysters or coral reefs to make their shells or their hard parts. Um, and this also presents a challenge really more broadly speaking um, for valuable West Coast and East Coast and Gulf Coast um, aquaculture, um, sustainable shellfish um, industry, which is a growing industry and could grow further if it wasn't being held back by the threat of this problem and this challenge to um, the shell growth in shellfish. But there's actually a myriad of other problems that this um, challenge presents. Ocean acidification, um, as we are learning, appears to impact things like crabs and lobsters, mussels, um, tiny floating snails that are the, at the base of the ocean food web, and even the behavior and physiology of fish. And so the impacts are broad. And um, much like with global climate change, the impacts are not just on the ocean environment, but I'm here to tell you more about the fact that they also impact people who rely on the ocean for income. Our ability to sustainably harvest and farm food from the sea will be fundamentally threatened by this process. And I think you'll hear from my colleague Margaret that it already is threatening. To that end, in California, we've partnered with shellfish farmers for over five years to try to understand these impacts. And scientists and industry experts around the country have done the same. And so um, these partnerships are showing leadership towards trying to understand the problem but also develop adaptation strategies. And along those lines, I'd like to focus for just a few minutes about the kinds of things that we've learned about ocean acidification, but also some solutions that might help us tackle it. So for example, using a combination of research from NOAA and the National Science Foundation, we've been able to develop maps like these. This shows the acidity of, or the pH of seawater off the US West Coast. In this image, you can see there are areas along the coast that are naturally more acidic than others. Those are blue in color. What we learned from analyses like this is that ocean acidification does not behave like a blanket along the coast. Rather, it is a patchwork quilt of variability. And we need to understand that variability in order to make decisions in our communities. We would not know this information without federal science, and this is the kind of information we need to be able to make decisions on managing for resilience against ocean acidification. Another important lesson that we've learned is that our vulnerability, human vulnerability to acidification, will be based on a blend of oceanography of your region and then the reliance of that region upon, to, to fisheries and aquaculture income. So I'm featuring here some work by a colleague of mine, Julie Ekstrom, and she plotted the oceanographic vulnerability in purple. So the darker purple means that oceans in those areas will see these impacts faster. And then the human variable vulnerability um, in, in the sort of orange yellow colors. And um, the darker those colors show you um, that those people in those communities are more reliant upon income from fisheries and aquaculture. Why do we need this information? Well, now that we have this, we know both where we need to gather baseline oceanographic information to understand how the ocean is changing, but also we now know about the communities of people along the coast who need this information to adapt. So it won't surprise you that the ultimate solution to this problem is to curb our carbon dioxide emissions, but I also want to tell you about some other potential solutions or at least highlight one. There are some special ocean places that may help us tackle this problem. Habitats like seagrass beds, which are in the lower right, and kelp forests in the upper left, along with places like mangroves and salt marshes, they actually soak up carbon dioxide. These are special places that have vegetation utilizing photosynthesis, and through that photosynthesis, they're actually taking carbon dioxide out of the water and potentially storing it we're learning that we may be able to locally address acidification by preserving or restoring these important habitats. Seagrasses, more specifically, are widely distributed along US coastlines in the Northeast, Southeast, Gulf, and West Coast. 
there's ongoing work in many of these communities to understand how these habitats might actually take up carbon on a local scale. They take up carbon in the short term to the actual blades of the seagrass, just like the blades of a plant. But we think that they also store carbon for the long term in the sediments below the seagrass. You may have heard about this process. It's called blue carbon. We're currently working with the state of California to actually understand and quantify just how much carbon is stored in this way and how we might be able to harness the power of these special ocean places to aid in addressing ocean acidification. I'm just gonna conclude by reminding you that this is a big global problem, but it has a local touch on both environments that we care about and also coastal communities. The information that I've shown you today that's been gathered by federal science agencies, it provides a scaffolding. And upon that scaffolding, we can then build out our local solutions and build some resilience to ocean acidification. To that end, we really need our eyes on the ocean. And our eyes on the ocean is the role that federal agencies, including NOAA, the National Science Foundation, EPA, NASA, and others play. They help us understand this problem. There's not only a tremendous value in the investments we've made so far in this science, but we want to be able to utilize and build that value. We will need novel partnerships and innovative ideas to solve this problem, and it's my hope that we can work together to find solutions like this. And I think you'll hear similar message, messages from my co-panelists. On that note, I'll hand off to Dr. Gadan, who's at George Washington University investigating sea level impacts on coastal ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Tessa. Um, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak here today and tell you about this important topic of how sea level rise is affecting our coastal seascapes and landscapes. So very similar to warming and acidification, um, sea level rise is not occurring in the exact same way at all places. Uh, it varies across the ocean. And uh, it's especially a big impact in the eastern seaboard, the populated area of our country, uh, most populated area, uh, where we have a, spot, uh, a hot spot of sea level rise that's three times the global average. So in, in these areas, um, we're, we're uh, having rates of sea level rise that are going to exceed three feet in the next century. So that's why I do my research in the mid-Atlantic, where we're experiencing these really high rates. Um, and uh, we're seeing unprecedented changes in the coastlines. So I want to tell you about a few examples of what these changes look like. Uh, first off, a photo of Long Beach Island, New Jersey, uh, where, which was particularly affected by Hurricane Sandy. And here you can see a town uh, right near one of my field sites that was um, inundated during Hurricane Sandy, and you can see the sand kind of came up on the beach and affected all these properties, caused a lot of damage. And as sea levels rise, uh, storm surge or coastal flooding um, increases in height and reach and can, can reach more property, do more damage. Uh, moreover, these, these barrier islands, like the one where this town was located, protect mainland areas. And in some places, sea level rise is actually causing barrier islands to disintegrate, like where I work on the Virginia Eastern Shore. And when that happens, the areas behind the barrier island are exposed then to storm damages as well. And, and we're seeing other changes there. <clears throat> so you might have heard about you know, coastal storm flooding. Those tend to make news when those storms happen, those events. But somewhat maybe even more insidious is the daily tidal flooding that a lot of pace, places are experiencing much more often. Um, so for example, even here in Washington, DC, we're tidal, and we're seeing much more frequent tidal flooding. Uh, so we used to historically get about five or six days of tidal flooding per year, but that number has now gone up to over 50 days per year. And um, in the future, it's expected to increase to a daily occurrence in our city. 
Um, this is a photo of the tidal basin where you can imagine these uh, tidal impacts are not good for the cherry blossom trees or the, um, you know, all the um, activities that happen around the Cherry Blossom Festival and the dollars in tourism that that generates for our city. A lot of my work is concerning changes to coastal habitats, though, and so I want to take you to um, a different area and show you what that's looking like. This is an aerial photograph from the Delaware Bay, and it's, uh, it just illustrates very well some of the changes that I'm seeing also in the Chesapeake Bay. It's very similar. Um, so I just want to show you, this was a study done looking at aerial photography over a historic time period, and you can see the... Um, uh, point it. There we go. Here's the historic boundary between the forest and the salt marsh in those aerial photographs. Through time and sea level, during a period of sea level rise, that boundary has moved inland and we've seen forest retreat and marsh migration. So the habitat areas are changing. We're losing coastal forest. And during this time period, um, the amount of of salt marsh or tidal marsh stayed about the same because as it migrated inland, there was also lost, lost uh, area from the coast. But there's a big concern that we'll lose tidal wetland area as well if it can't keep pace with these accelerated rates of sea level rise. And uh, tidal wetlands, you may already know, provide a lot of important ecosystem services. Uh, just like barrier islands, they protect um, upland areas from storm surge and coastal flooding but they're also important for carbon storage, like Tessa was talking about. And um, they're also nursery habitat for some of our most important fishery products, including Gulf Coast shrimp and the blue crab, things that we all like to eat, and of course, are important economic drivers. <laughs> so when we see forest retreat, it's creating an area of ghost forests. Um, these, are, these are forests of dead trees. Uh, and they look like this from the air. It's kind of an eerie place to visit. And this is what it looks like on the ground. Most of those dead trees are loblolly pine because that's what our coastal forests are in the southeast. Uh, in the state of Maryland, the loblolly pine is our most important uh, timber species. And the timber industry in Maryland is a $4 billion industry that's being harmed by this process. And the loblolly pine is only distributed in counties, coastal counties in Maryland, those counties most vulnerable to sea level rise. So um, this is not good for our timber industry throughout the whole coastal plain. And lastly, agriculture. Coastal agriculture is also being affected. Um, this is a site where I was just a couple days ago in the lower eastern shore of Maryland. Um, where that sandy area in the back that looks like a bare beach, that is a cornfield in the middle of July. In the coastal plain, we have 138,000 acres of uh, agricultural areas that are within three feet of sea level. And remember, three feet is the amount of sea level rise we're predicted to see in the next century. So these areas are going to be inundated, and even before they're inundated, they're experiencing saltwater intrusion. So that's what we're seeing right now. This is not an area that's regularly inundated, uh, only during really high storm flooding. But we are seeing groundwater um, salinization. And so the groundwaters below this field were about 10 parts per thousand. That's about one third the salinity of ocean water. OK. And, um, and so this is a major problem for farmers. I just want to show you a photo up close of this cornfield that I took this week. Growing in the foreground is a species of plant called Salicornia europaea. That's one of the most salt tolerant plants in the world. And it's growing in the middle of a cornfield. That means something's wrong. <laughs> There's also not a lot of corn growing in that cornfield. And you can see in the background um, the stunted corn that was able to germinate in this field. But the entire field was planted. And this is just representative of a trend that we're seeing out in this region of the Delmarva Peninsula. Um, and I've been hearing from colleagues who work farther in the southeast that there's problems all up and down the coastal plain. 
So we're trying to figure out solutions for these farmers, whether they can grow salt tolerant crops or there's other ways to transition these fields into productive uses. Um, but you can look up specific changes for your, re your region and solutions at this website, which was a, a result of a collaboration between the Nature Conservancy and federal agencies like the EPA, sorry, the USGS, NASA, and the National Park Service, as well as some other groups. And lastly, um, I just want to acknowledge the government data that went into understanding this problem, like the USGS uh, scientists who published the rate of sea level rise being a hot spot in the northeast of three times the global rate, and, um, and the NOAA data, the NOAA tide gauge data that was used to understand that problem. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Gadan. We'd like to have Representative Christ come up and give some comments. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm well. What's your name? John Bruno. Hey, John. I'm Charlie. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Is this your notebook, John? It's, it's Dr. Somebody's Gadan's. Notes. Let me turn this bad boy on. It's hot around here today. <laughs> you guys notice? Hi, my name is uh, Charlie Christ. I'm a freshman member of Congress. and. Honored to be with you today. We have been called for votes, so I'm going to give sort of a short talk. Um, but what you're here about is awfully important, uh, especially to me. Um, Florida, as you know, is a peninsula. As a result of that uh, topography, we are probably the state most susceptible to rising sea level. So it's a big deal and a big concern. How many of you are from Florida? Anybody? Good man. Um, how about coastal states? Very good. Well, then you understand this very, very well, I'm sure, or you wouldn't be here. But uh, it's incredibly important to me in addition to the fact of what part of Florida I am from. Uh, I grew up in St. Petersburg, <clears throat> which is in Pinellas County, which is a peninsula on the peninsula of Florida. It's on the West Coast. Are you from Florida? Where? Then you know it pretty well. Wonderful. So, and it's not really partisan, at least it isn't in Florida, for the most part, I should say. Um, there are exceptions to that as uh, on every issue, but, but with this one in Florida, the environment generally and climate change specifically, uh, we pretty much get it, for the most part, um, with the current administration in Florida uh, as an exception. Uh, as I understand it, Sarah, I think they wouldn't allow their staff to even mention climate change. So there, there's that. But at any rate, go figure, right? It's hard to imagine. But it is important that as Americans we understand how important this is to all of us so that we can share that with our friends, so that they have the opportunity to understand why it's important to be engaged in this issue. Uh, it's probably the most important issue facing our country because it's facing our planet. And if we don't get about the business of addressing it and doing something about it, all the other issues go away. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because um, there is a key uh, outside of Miami called Virginia Key right now where NOAA has an office. Um, and one of the reasons they need to depart that office is that the sea level is rising uh, and will soon engulf that key. Well, that's happening all over Florida. I mean, I told you I grew up in St. Petersburg, and I now have a condo in downtown St. Pete, and my parents live in the northeast part of St. Petersburg, but it's also right close to the water. And when I drive over to visit them on a weekend, I can literally see the difference in how much higher the water is now than five years ago. I mean, it's dramatic. And you've probably heard of what they call king tides, when it's even higher uh, and more aggressive. It's unbelievable uh, how it's increasing. So it's real important that we address this issue. I cannot thank you enough for caring about it, uh, for participating uh, in this today, uh, especially you all. Um, it's, it's really a big deal. And it really matters to the future of America and the future of the world. So God bless you for what you're doing. Thank you for being engaged and stay engaged. How many of you are registered to vote? How many of you are not? 
fabulous. As President Obama used to say, don't boo, vote. It matters. God bless. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Representative Christ. I think we have Senator Whitehouse. Would you like to give some remarks now? Senator, how are you? Great to see you. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Good to see you all, and I could not be happier to be invited over from the Senate side to come and uh, join this gathering on the House side, thanks to uh, Representative Grijalva and the House Natural Resources Committee Democrats. So thank you very much for hosting this. Um, I'm from Rhode Island. Rhode Island is the ocean state, so we take this whole oceans business uh, pretty seriously. I have a little bit of a debate with Brian Schatz about how it is that Rhode Island gets to be the ocean state and not Hawaii. <laughs> Short answer, we got there first. We took the name. <laughs> but what you learn as you look at this issue, there's been a huge amount of controversy that has been artificially created by the fossil fuel industry in order to generate phony doubt about climate change. Where they haven't gone is to the ocean's effects on climate change. So from a point of view of having a conversation about this, this is actually relatively unsullied uh, territory for us. It's also territory in which the facts get very hard to confuse or deny, because the results are things you measure with complicated instruments like thermometers <laughs> and essentially yardsticks that do sea level rise and the kind of acidification tests that a middle school will manage for the science class aquarium. This is not hugely complicated modeling. So it's really hard to deny things like the law of thermal expansion. Um, but what we see out there is that, first of all, thank the oceans because better than 90% of the added heat that we have trapped in our atmosphere by virtue of climate change has gone into the oceans. We wouldn't be worried about a two degree increase, we'd be worried about a 30 degree increase if it weren't for the oceans taking up so much of that heat. Like I said, more than 90% of it. That obviously creates a lot of warming. Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island is up nearly four degrees mean winter water temperature. I spoke to, my wife's a marine scientist, I spoke to her major professor, who I said stupidly, so what's the big deal? I can't tell the difference between 61 and 65 degrees. And he said perceptively, you are not a fish. <laughs> a fish knows the difference between a t temperature that hovers around 61 to 65 degrees, and it's actually a full ecosystem shift when that takes place. So winter flounder, which is what Sandra was studying when we were young and when she was a grad student, and was then the major winter catch, the major fishery of Narragansett Bay, is essentially gone. It only turns up as bycatch in other nets because of that ecosystem shift. And of course, law of thermal expansion, when things get warm, they heat, the ocean isn't gonna go down, they expand, the ocean isn't gonna go down, it's gonna go up. So uh, we've seen about 10 inches of sea level rise measured at NOAA's Naval Station Newport Tide Gauge since the 1930s. And we're looking at six to nine feet by the end of the century, which means that our entire map changes. If any of you know Rhode Island, there's a beautiful place called Block Island, one of nature's last great places. Well, it's gonna be two of nature's, nature's last great places at those uh, predictions because it gets flooded and turns into two islands. Beautiful Jamestown becomes three islands. A place called Warwick Neck becomes Warwick Neck Island. Historic Bristol and nearby Warren become an island. I live in Newport. The western part of Newport gets carved off and becomes an island. Downtown Newport floods after having been a key part of American history for close on 400 years now. And while that's all happening, 30% of the carbon dioxide that would otherwise be up there baking us has actually been chemically absorbed by the oceans. And you can do the chemistry pretty easily. I did it on the Senate floor. I took a glass of water, which they give you when you're on the Senate floor. I put a little bit of that blue pH dye into it. I took a aquarium bubbler and a piece of hose. And while I was giving my speech, I interrupted it for a minute to blow my carbon dioxide exhalations through the bubbler 
And I did a before and after with the glass up against a graphic that related the color to the pH. So just with one breath, I was able to dramatically change the pH of that glass of water. And that's essentially what carbon dioxide is doing to our oceans. The latest really solid survey of the pteropod, which is a beautiful little snail that has developed its little snail foot into an oceanic wing and is essentially the base species of the Pacific Oceanic food chain. The last big survey that was done about four or five years ago showed that uh, more than 50% of the pteropods were experiencing severe shell damage because it's really hard to live in an atmosphere or ecosystem around you in which you are soluble, which is actively degrading your, in the case of uh, pteropod, your exoskeleton, your shell. So the effects of this are really coming home to roost. I'm a scuba diver. I remember going to a beach in Jamaica as a, when my daughter was very young and we went back constantly. The place off that beach used to be a reef. It is now rubble, and we've watched it degrade little by little by little. Uh, Andaman Sea, the reefs have basically been wiped out. There are a few surviving, but it's been really hit hard. Great chunks of the barrier reef, one of the natural wonders of the world, visible from space, clobbered by the combination of heating and acidification. And if you lose your reefs, that's pretty bad because that's the incubator for so many fish species. If you like fish, you need reefs. And uh, it's really hard to undo that harm. Fisheries are moving around. As I mentioned, the winter flounder in Rhode Island. Um, we are seeing coastal impacts. I want to read you two things that I brought with me that come from pretty interesting publications. The first statement comes from Freddie Mac, which is the big government-supported home mortgage insurer. I'll quote them. The economic losses and social disruption may happen gradually, but they are likely to be greater in total than those experienced in the housing crisis and Great Recession. You know what he's talking about? Sea level rise against our coasts and the loss of housing stock uh, as people have to flee uninhabitable areas in which they had invested. It's not just the government giving that warning either. The trade publication Risk and Insurance has called the threat of climate change along our shores a growing and alarming threat. And I'll quote them here. Continually rising seas will damage coastal, residential, and commercial property values to the point that property owners will flee those markets in droves, thus precipitating a mortgage value collapse that could equal or exceed the mortgage crisis that rocked the global economy in 2008. And I'll close by saying that we have, since the earliest days of the habitation of North America by European colonists, set ourselves apart as an example to the world. From John Winthrop to Ronald Reagan, we've talked about being a city on a hill. And we offer ourselves as an example to the world. If the suffering that we can anticipate from climate change, particularly where it's ocean driven, if that starts hitting home around the world, people who are now living at subsistence levels are going to ask questions. And they're going to be entitled to answers. And like all human beings, they're going to want justice. And our answers are going to be hard ones to the questions, why is it that for 30 or 40 years, you knew all this was happening? Your universities, your military, your national labs, everybody knew this was happening, and you did nothing about it. You just sat there and let your emissions ruin our lives. That's a tough question to have to answer if you think that you're the city on the hill that's offering democracy as an example to the world. And the fact of the matter is that the answer is not a good one. It's because we have not had the political courage to stand up to the fossil fuel industry, which has disgracefully used the power that Citizens United gave it to crush Republican cooperation on climate action. History will be absolutely clear about that. There is no second story and it will not look good for us. So we have every kind of interest, from environmental to economic to continuing the prestige and honor of our country to get this right. 
So keep fighting. We have lots of room for progress. Even little things are making the move in the right way. Just yesterday, I announced a bill with Heidi Heidkamp of North Dakota, John Barrasso of Wyoming, and uh, Shelley Capito of West Virginia to put a price on carbon reduction, kind of the reverse of a price on carbon emissions, but an early step. So little steps by little steps, but we need continued pressure. So I'm glad you answered Representative Crest's question about being voters. Don't let 2018 get by you. Thank you. Representative Bonamici. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. What a great champion we have in the Senate. I'm Suzanne Bonamici, and I'm honored to represent the 1st Congressional District in Oregon. Uh, I serve on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, as well as uh, uh, being the ranking member on the Environment Subcommittee, and I'm also the co-chair of the Oceans Caucus. Uh, and I'm going to be very brief in my remarks because I have just a couple minutes to get up to vote, but I wanted to thank all of you for being here today, and Representative Grijalva, who I think probably went to vote um, for helping to organize this forum and for your uh, concern and attention and action on climate change. Thank you to all of our panelists for explaining their research and experience in mitigating and adapting uh, to changing ocean conditions as a result of climate change. We have had many conversations about that in my home state of Oregon. As I really do, don't tell my colleagues I said this, but I really do represent the, the most beautiful, best district. But I have the Columbia River as the northern boundary of my district, and the Pacific Ocean is the western boundary, and Portland on the east side, and wine country on the south. So really, it <laughs> doesn't get any better. Uh, but my constituents know and understand how important uh, ocean health is and marine resources. We have some wonderful marine reserves there off our coast. But we also uh, really need to recognize it. It is past time for Congress to step up uh, and take action to address the threats to our oceans and ocean health. We need more research. We need to continue the Sea Grant program, which is on the chopping block in the administration's budget. Um, recently, I welcomed Dr. Hales from Oregon State University. He came to the Science Committee to talk about something he developed called the Berkelator. Um, his name is Burke, <laughs> the Berkelator. It's an autonomous analyzer. It's about the size of a piece of carry-on luggage that's helped our shellfish growers across the Pacific Northwest determine the best time to grow larvae. Uh, our shellfish industry has really been threatened by ocean acidification, and now the Berkelator can determine the ocean's ability to form the calcium carbonates that are needed for shell formation. And it can be installed on ships, and it's allowed shellfish growers to really take control uh, of their livelihoods by putting those tools to work, and none of this would have been possible without federal research. So it's a plug for federal research, but we it's also um, an indication that it's uh, it's time not to just adapt, but to curb uh, what's happening in our oceans. So last night, um, Sarah, who works in my office, and I were with a group um, who here saw in the Capitol saw Chasing Coral, a wonderful new documentary that will be on Netflix tomorrow. So you have no excuse to uh, to not see it. I highly recommend it. It is a beautiful documentary about uh, coral and what's happening with the bleaching and the death of coral. And um, it, is, it is sad. Um, Representative Kilmer from Washington organized it. I said, thank you for making me depressed. But at the same time, uh, the lessons that we learned from that movie uh, and that movie uh, being released across the country, uh, Sarah's telling me I have to go, uh, will help uh, take action. So thank you for being here. We need to, to keep working on this. Let your voices be heard, and I'm going to run to vote. Thank you all. Thank you. Next up, we're so lucky to have here Ms. Margaret Pilaro Barrett, who's the Executive Director of the Pacific Coast Shellfish Growers Association. And so she's going to talk to us about the problems and solutions they've been having there. Thank you. So um, 
Thank you all for being here, and thank you for your interest in this, and thank you to the committee for bringing this panel together. Um, shellfish uh, production, or shellfish in general, is an important part of the West Coast as it is other coastal regions. We have over 100 years of shellfish growing on the, on the West Coast. Uh, we know for certain that it fueled the expansion west and the um, gold rush. Um, and we have towns named after shellfish and because it's a very important part of the, of the community. Our, my, I represent an organization that have members all the way up and down the West Coast. I also work in collaboratively with the, the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association that has members there as well as the industry in, in the Gulf Coast. Um, the industry on the West Coast is multi-generational, so many of the farmers that we have today are grandparent, have grandparents and great-grandparents that were shellfish farmers. Um, and we've seen a lot of evolution in the industry over the last 100 or so years, both in terms of species as well as the products that are being enjoyed by, um, by folks. Um, shellfish does not grow everywhere, but where it does, it's most happy. Uh, there's a map here where we've got all of our shellfish growing areas. Um, and we know on the West Coast, those numbers are a little bit old, but we are well over $230 million just in the value of the actual shellfish. Um, of that, most of the U.S., oysters are the most prevalent. Um, and then there's some value numbers there. And then clams. The uh, clam that that woman is holding is a gooey duck, which is a giant burrowing clam, which is our most sort of, other than the uh, orca whales, the most iconic um, this picture of, of shellfish on, from the West Coast, uh, and I encourage you all to try that. We are facing in this country a 90% seafood deficit, so that means we as, a, as citizens are importing 90% of the seafood in which we are eating. The only thing that is worse trade deficit than that is oil. So there is a real push to try to grow more of our own food created ourselves, and aquaculture, and particularly shellfish aquaculture, where there isn't any other inputs going into to produce it, is a really great way to do that. Um, over the years, we've also seen a change in um, where the shellfish comes from. You've heard a couple of people talk about hatcheries. Um, in the early days, the shellfish all came from natural set, and there is still some natural set that happens, but it's nowhere near at the levels that are necessary to support the industry. And so we have three very large hatcheries on the West Coast uh, that are producing sort of the baby oysters or clams, uh, if you will. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a sec here, too. Um, we're also a big source of jobs. Most of these counties where shellfish jobs occur are ones that have higher than normal um, uh, unemployment rates. And between the West and the East Coast, we're employing well over 6,000 people in actual shellfish production. And we know from FAO reports that for every one job of shellfish production, we have, or aquaculture production, we have uh, three more jobs in marketing, uh, processing, and, and distribution. So it is a driver, particularly for these, these communities. So we've heard a little bit about the ocean acidification and these changes, and we talked a little bit about these hatcheries. Well, in 2010, we saw a significant mass mortality of the larvae coming out of two of the three large West Coast hatcheries. And it was really troubling because the entire industry would have been completely depressed by that kind of loss. And there were lots of questions about what it could be. Was it a natural occurring bacteria, the causing illness, and so on? And we actually were timely working with some of the research that was already shown and, and realized that there was um, some acidification that was occurring. And the larvae, which, which needs to have a chemical composition in order to survive, was not surviving. So here on the left is a, is a picture of the normal uh, shellfish production what would happen, and then uh, in acidic waters, how that shell um, actually is ill-formed. So shellfish cannot grow in inhabitable waters, and so um, this is really the, the basic of realization that we were seeing a response to these changing conditions. We were also seeing other changes, um, and some of which are affecting the species. The mussels are certainly um, have being affected by higher temperatures and lower pH. The abyssal threads that attach the mussels to places where they grow are no longer as strong, and we're seeing changes there. 
We know that species, as we heard, are, are going in other areas where they weren't growing and are no longer growing where we have grown accustomed to them. So as a, as a farming community, this is really troubling because we have to be adaptive to where the species are, are growing. We're seeing lots more changes in, in wind intensity, storm frequency, storm intensity. Um, and these are all things that require different types of equipment, different types of farming um, practices and response, health and safety issues. So these are all things that, that growers have to take into consideration. The other thing that we're also seeing, and, and we need much more research and understanding on this, is the frequency of um, bacteria that causes illness in, in consumers, as well as biotoxins from um, harmful algal blooms. And these are, these are problems not just to the shellfish growers and the shellfish consumers, but you, you won't want to recreate in a body of water that has been taken over by a harmful algal bloom. It's just not safe. So there are some other implications of this as well, and we know that these are driven by ocean changes that we've been seeing. Uh, this picture here on the left is the Berkelator. Uh, that was just spoken about. And this seriously um, has been a, a, an instrumental piece to the success of continuing the, the industry and the success of where we're going. We're also relying on a lot of monitoring uh, through the Integrated Oceans Observing System, um, the IUS, or the IUSians is what we call them. They have systems all around the country. And our growers are actually using this data portal on a regular basis to understand what are the currents doing? What is the salinity? What are the temperatures? How do they, act, how do they change their activities based on what will be coming and what's happening in nearshore so that they can respond accordingly? Last slide? OK. Um, and then we're also looking at um, research through genetics, um, research and understanding the native species, um, we're looking at policy. We've got an ocean um, blue ribbon panel on ocean acidification that has actually come up with some um, recommendations, and, and the states on the West Coast are all joining into that as well. So one more. This is what we want for our future. We want giant oysters. We want giant clams. We want happy people enjoying shellfish. And uh, we need to have all of these partnerships that we have been enjoying and attention to this issue um, and support from decision makers to ensure that this is an industry that will continue along into the future. So thank you very much for your time today, and thank you all to the panel for this. Thank you. We'd like to take a few questions from the audience. Um, you could either raise your hand or you could come up to the microphone if you feel like your, your voice won't be loud enough to be heard in the room. Yes. Um, so you were talking on um, essentially, in fact, I'm rotating my roof tank a lot in and out from IUC issues. Um, is that also because like the labor prices in general are cheaper um, due to allocation of species? Well, there's there's a you're you're right in in, in some regards. Um, sometimes actually you can harvest at wild stock fish here in this country, and it's cheaper to process it overseas, and then it comes back. Um, but uh, so, so the numbers are probably need to be dissected a little bit more to understand what's really growing, what's really coming here. But we eat a lot of species that are not, that are not accustomed to growing in this country. So there is still a fair amount of, of product that is coming from um, overseas. And, and we eat a lot of shrimp. And most of the shrimp is because of economic reasons, I think, being purchased from overseas, just because it's so much cheaper than it is in the United States. But then you have to sort of weigh that from, you know, we have a lot of really great, important regulations in the US. And so if we're getting our fish from elsewhere, how is that being managed? How is that being grown? What, what costs are associated with that? Sure. Yes, sir, back there. Well, we know that there's a Pacific County in Washington State is one of the most fish-dependent counties in the nation. 
So they have crab, they have other uh, tuna and other, other fish that they, that they pull in. We've got significant shellfish farms there. Um, if there is no fishery, if there are no healthy oceans to support that, that county, which already is quite depressed, um, would lose tremendously. So in, in terms of the, that perspective, you know, this is, there, are, there are communities all around the country that are developed on recognizing that, that, that resource that's in their front yard, if you will. And uh, it's, it's immeasurable what would happen if there was no ability to continue to, to have fisheries. I'll just try to add to that, that I think we're, I showed a study where <clears throat> we are trying to understand where these climate and ocean acidification impacts overlap with human vulnerability. And we're just, just starting to understand that. I just wanted to add to that about sea level rise. Um, you know, people weren't farming on beaches mm -hmm. or right at the water's edge. Um, it's taken a little while for these impacts to catch up with us, but they're catching up with us now. And we're going to start to see a lot of impacts due to sea level rise, economic impacts on communities that are uh, located at low elevation, which is largely in our country the coastal plain that stretches from New Jersey down to Florida and along the Gulf Coast. And so we're going to see impacts to properties we're already seeing, um, like in Hampton Roads, these, these awful uh, daily flooding events and a lot of uh, homeowners struggling there. They, they can't get flood insurance. They can't sell their properties. Um, but we're also going to start seeing industries majorly affected, industries that are not necessarily your traditional ocean industries, not even outside of fisheries. Um, we're going to start seeing timber industry affected and agricultural industry, and that includes animal farms that are located near the coast. Thank you. I see a hand going up in the back. That's a great question. Yeah. Tessa and I talk about that a lot. We're, we're both pretty active on Twitter, and we mostly discuss it on Twitter. Right, um, so we both do a lot of outreach, but we really struggle to reach most people. So I live in Chapel Hill, Carborough, where I think most people are aware of climate change in the oceans. And Tessa often gives talks in San Francisco, yeah. and sometimes I'll river like river like, wow, you changed a lot of minds last night, right? <laughs> and I think that's a real struggle to kind of get out into communities away from university towns, right, where people aren't aware uh, of climate change. And um, I think we're still figuring that out. I mean, the Netflix film coming out, you know, tomorrow. On, on coral, I mean, hopefully that can start reaching a broader audience, but I, I really worry about that. So, you know, there's things in the New York Times all the time about climate change, right? But a lot of people don't read the New York Times. This is a great question, and I, I think we think about this and worry about it a lot. And my current approach on this is to try to do a lot more listening, because I feel like I can understand how to communicate to people about climate change and ocean acidification if I start first from a listening place about what matters to them. So um, it may seem counterintuitive, but my communication efforts right now actually really center around asking other people what they care about, and then we figure out how this might impact them. One more quick thing to add on that. I think it's important that we remember to communicate all the way through and, and, and not just stop right at the science and, and go all the way to the end. Um, about a year or so, maybe two years ago, I was flooded by a bunch of um, questions and reporters, all starting with, so we can't eat oysters anymore. We shouldn't eat oysters. I passed up in having oysters when the last time I was at a restaurant because of ocean acidification. And that is not the message. You know, we want you to keep eating oysters. We want there to still be oysters for you to eat. Once the oyster has created its shell, have at it, enjoy it, um, grill it, fry it, whatever you want to do to it. Uh, because I think there's this misconception that it's it's bad all around, and 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 you can't have it. Um, so I think when we can modify our, our approaches 
work, adapt to create a situation where the oysters can survive and then please enjoy them? <laughs> that was a great question. Thank you. I think you had your hand up. Yeah. I'm probably the closest. I work in estuaries, so brackish waters, so it's a little more on the freshwater end of the spectrum. Um, and yeah, we're seeing warmer waters. We're seeing uh, more eutrophication, which is a mix of nitrogen pollution, but warming exacerbates um, because on, when, when water is warmer, uh, organisms need more oxygen to breathe, and water holds less oxygen. So um, you know, dead zones and eutrophication impacts are going to be exacerbated by warming. And that means we're going to re have to redouble efforts on nutrient mitigation in order to compensate for the greater eutrophication we're going to experience in a warmer world. So Senator Whitehouse um, said he wasn't a fish. And, and the reason that he's different, you know, he experiences climate change different from a fish is because he's warm-blooded, right? He regulates his body temperature. And really the big reason why a lot of these critters are affected by temperature is they're cold-blooded, they're ectotherm. So their their body temperature matches the water temperature. So if the water warms by 5 degrees Fahrenheit, their body temperature warms by that much. And you all can imagine, you know, what that does to your bodies. If you're running a fever of 103, I mean, that's nearly lethal. And so these animals' t body temperatures track that te that change. And one of the really interesting things is their metabolism tracks it too. So with warming, their metabolism really cranks up and they have to eat more food. And with cooling, everything slows down. Like I've dove in the Gulf of Maine when it's like two degrees Fahrenheit. And like you can almost re swim up and grab the fish. They're all just like really slow. Everything slows down. But there's all kinds of fascinating food web and ecosystem implications of that. And that's one thing we're seeing in lakes. So predators need to eat more prey to maintain their body mass. So their metabolisms crank up. They start swimming faster, they eat more, then their prey eat more. And so we see all kinds of shifts in kind of the structure of food webs, the distribution of biomass. And some of those are just interesting ecologically, but some of them are really problematic for people, such as fisheries. So it can radically reduce the standing biomass of a fish species that you know, you're, you're harvesting either commercially or recreationally. Yes. Um, well, so right now, they're, they're actually not responding too much to sea level rise, and that's part of the problem is that, um, for example, the farmers that we're working with are continuing to mostly farm just like they did, and that's why you're seeing this crop failure. Um, they're sowing corn, a very salt intolerant crop, on a field they know is salty because they don't, we haven't developed the best management practices for them to switch to. Um, and they're abandoning land. That's the other alternative, is just to stop farming on those lands. And so what my colleagues and I are trying to do is develop uh, some different strategies for them in terms of either incentivizing uh, land conservation in lands that are not performing very well, so maybe um, providing a, a a benefit to farmers who willingly set those lands aside, as we do with other marginal croplands, or um, also developing salt-tolerant crops that they might be able to use, and, and crop alternatives like, like switchgrass for biofuel, which is a very salt-tolerant species, and, and will extend the lifetime of those lands. So uh, that's one example. I would be happy to provide some examples from um, my interaction with sustainable shellfish industry, if you'd like me to, Margaret. Um, so I, I sort of, I work with um, a couple different groups in California that are um, raising shellfish, and I can tell you what I observe from this groups, these groups about their adaptation. Um, one is the first step is through gaining information, and so the instruments that were mentioned earlier, the percolators, 
um, really are key to this. So putting instrumentation in the hatchery or farm settings so that they actually have oceanographic data you know, flowing in and it's also publicly available so everybody gets to share that data. And then with that information, they're making decisions um, for example, thinking about types of shellfish that might be the best to grow in the future, or even genetic strains of shellfish that will be adapted to these future conditions. And finally, they're using information like the study that I told you about, about the seagrass taking up some of the carbon dioxide, and some of these farmers are starting to actually put the shellfish side by side um, in, with a habitat like seagrass that actually might locally make the environment um, better in terms of ocean acidification. So I'm seeing a lot of um, creative solutions and adaptations um, in order to keep those businesses healthy and sustainable for the long run. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm not aware of hardly any activity um, in, in that regard. They, they often argue against climate change. Uh, the only time when I hear them arguing for it is when they're kind of blaming overfishing or the declines in their stocks, it, that arguing that it's not fishing per se, it's, it's warming, which in some places they're right. I mean, we should have a lot more buy-in from them, right? So we're talking about the loss of their industry, their livelihoods, and the resources that they depend on. Maybe, I don't really have the answer on how to engage. Maybe, like Tessa just suggested, listening, talking with them. Right, and, and from, you know, from, the, from my perspective and the association piece, and then I know from the East Coast growers as well, this is something that we don't really have the luxury of time to get actively involved to turn the spigot off on carbon emissions. We just don't. We have to figure out how to continue adapting and how to use the information that is available and, and require or demand that information stays coming to us. And through the partnerships and through the federal funding and, and so on, and, and, and that's how we, that's where we have to put our energy. We, we have to either ad adapt or close. And um, so that's how, that's how we're approaching it. And I think from following some of the things on the, on the lobster men and so on, that's also where they're, they're trying to figure out what, what to do. Because we've told, been told that there's still 50 years of bad water. If you turn off that spigot today, we've still got 50 years of bad water. Any other questions? Okay, well, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Christine Sir for organizing this, of course. And I'd like to thank all of our expert witnesses. Thank you for coming. Two of them flew in.